Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. And thank you for being here today. I know that your time is precious. And as always, I want to help deliver the best shows there are that we will all find our freedom and experience life to the fullest. And today is going to be that kind of day. All right. So just remember, anytime during the show you want to call in, you are welcome to. You have an open invitation from me to call in anytime you want, no matter what. Just call in at 919-518-9773, or you can come in on Skype Voice, and that is computers. That's the number, that's plural, the number two, K Voice, anytime you like. And we also have a chat attached to our uh, show just put your name, nickname, whatever you like, and you can comment, ask questions in there as well. But please, 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 please remember that I love it when you call in. So don't forget. So before we get on with our show and I introduce my guest, I want to say hi to Amnon Who. Without him, oh my goodness. Hello. How are you? Fine. How are you? I'm good. And you? What's going on? Nothing's going on. Everything good? Yeah. You're very cheery these days. No, no complaints. Good. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, even if you did, I'd listen. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes, even in those complaints, we find our golden opportunities, don't we? And it's all part of our the lessons that we get to learn in life and yep. through our observing and all that kind of stuff. And you know what? Sometimes lending an ear to somebody is exactly what that person needs. So anytime you have a complaint, you can bring it here. Okay. So let's get on with our show. And please don't forget, you can call in anytime you like. So today our guest is Dr. John Teske, and, and he has a sense of humor. He's got lots to share. He is a former um, professor, rock and roll professor, they say. He likes beer, I know, and he has a <laughs> lot of things to share with us, and we're going to share a whole bunch of things, and maybe not in that order. So welcome, John, to our show. Well, thank you for having me. This is going to be a blast. It is going to be a blast. So in your words, tell us who you are. Well, I, like I say, you know, I was a professor for 37 years, which was a great life, but it's also breaking free in a way to be, be past that, to be um, being able to do some less scholarly writing, um, to speak to writers and to interviewers of various kinds about the stuff that is fascinating me that I can just be thinking about all the time now. Um, and I, I write a roughly three times a month blog called neuromyth.com. That's my advertisement. Um, and it's really about neuromythology is about this approach to understanding people by understanding how stories, the stories they tell about themselves and the stories that are told about them engage our brains and engage our emotional lives. And in some sense are the center of how we make sense and meaning out of the world. So Telling a lot of stories is, is a big part of what it's about. And in fact, some of my blogs are autobiographical stories of my own. So that's, that's kind of where I start out. Yeah, I love you're talking my language when you talk stories. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here, babe. <laughs> oh, that's where, you know, we find our humanity, our connection. I mean, I know that who you are based on where you've been. You know, and I, it's, and I want to get on with more of this, but I do, you know, like I've been saying to a lot of people lately, you know, sometimes we don't understand somebody's actions until yeah. we understand their story. Well, so. there's some great stuff. Eric Erickson used to write about this. And there's a sense in which becoming an adult in our society, in Western society generally, means being able to account for your actions as if they had some purpose. And a lot of times you do something, you don't really know exactly why you did it, mm -hmm. but then you make something up. And what you make up may be what you remember about it because. We mainly remember in language and stories. So a lot of things that happen, we only remember because we put it in storied form. That's probably true of our dreams. Mm -hmm. um, if you wake up from a dream and don't tell the story or write it down, it goes away pretty fast. But if you tell it, write it in a journal, tell it to somebody else, tell it to your partner, tell it very quickly, then you can retain it in a way you couldn't otherwise. And I think that's true about much of our lives when uh, a little kid's growing up. There's, you know, something called infantile amnesia where kids actually can remember and have familiarity with lots of stuff, but it's when they start telling stories about themselves that they start having a memory of their own lives. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about those stories is they really start out 
with someone else telling them to you about yourself. So I think one of the really interesting things about the stories of our lives is that the root of them, the basis of them, it probably starts in stories that your mom or dad told about you that you only remember because they've told them a zillion times. So you can, do you consider yourself like the story scientist? Um, I think there's a lot of story scientists out of, mm -hmm. uh, around there. I think I'm, I'm one of the th people that's able to focus a lot more on how that engages emotions. I think emotions are always stories. They're all, they're, they're put in a kind of scripted form and we learn those different scripts in different cultures, in different ways as we grow up, um, learn to tie particular bodily feelings with particular images and particular situations. And we develop a repertoire of those things, but it starts out with, with things we're being told by other people. It, emotions are amazing to me. I mean, you think about a little kid expressing emotions and you know exactly what they're feeling because nothing's hidden. Everything that they are feeling is expressed immediately on their faces. So it's really easy to tell what little kids are feeling. How did you ever learn the words for your emotional life? You learn them because they were obvious to the people around you that could then name them and give you the vocabulary to talk about a life that then only later starts to get hidden, starts to become more interior, starts to become more private. I think a lot of the stuff about our lives, about what we think is interior versus exterior, are things that we've taken into ourselves, learned about, and then it becomes part of our, our well, we think of it as a private life, but even that interior life isn't as private as we think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the kind of revolution that happened in the early part of the 20th century, where until that point, people thought a lot that our introspections, what we think about when we think about our own minds working is privileged, that nobody else has access to it, to it but you, and incorrigible that you can't be wrong. And it turns out with Freud and with depth psychology that n neither of those things are really true. That we, we, other people sometimes can tell what we're feeling better than we can, that we're not so incorrigible, they're not so private. Um, a crock of an eyebrow or the, the, how the corner of your mouth turns over when you have a certain expression can be picked up by other people when you can't even pick it up, when you don't really know what's going on. And that then becomes the story that someone else tells about you that can then become part of yours. So, so it's all these intertwined stories. You so know. I want to go back to just one thing you said, and then I just want to uh, clarify something else. So, so yes, early on, people would tell us how we feel, so to speak. And well, I think, I think they're better at telling us what we're feeling what because we're they're feeling. accurate, because our feelings are expressed very obviously. And then as we get older, we don't want anybody to tell us how we feel. We start hiding those things. When my oldest son was, he was four or five years old and he started, had these huge scenes of animals laid out over our rec room. And he reached the point that he was, no, he wasn't quite putting that stuff just inside his head, but he started hiding his play space. That's how it starts to become private and interior is you start hiding. You start showing a poker face, you're not start not expressing your emotions as clearly um, because then you, you develop this barrier between yourself and other people. So is it that we're hiding it or is it that we don't want anybody to tell us what it is because we're figuring it out? Well, it, it's both of those things, really. When you it's initially you're just learning the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. As you become older, you start to, to hide it because you haven't figured out. But, you know, unfortunately, and, you know, I hate to blame millennials for this because it's true for all of us. You know, when we do more and more text-based communication, we're afraid. And people use that a lot because it's not scary. Because you don't make yourself vulnerable when you do that. But that also means people can't read your emotions. They can't read their, your nonverbal behavior. You can, you know, plot and revise. And you check everything out. And as a result, and there's, there's people that, that write about this that say, as a result, people that function that way really don't develop as good of a sense of themselves because they don't take that downtime to sort of work it out for themselves. Yeah, one of the best things. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. Finish what you were going to say. One yeah. of the best things that that I try to get people to do is to to journal. Um, if you write in a journal, that's a much better way of figuring things out for yourself in the same kind of storied form, because that's that's where how we use words, how we put them together, so that you then have a better sense of yourself. Right, because through a journal, you can hear way. yourself. You can hear yourself yeah. through a journal. So before yeah. we go any further, because there's a lot that we can talk about, 
what just talk about your your days as a professor so we have a little bit more of a of a base so you were what okay. kind of a of a professor i was a psychology professor okay. but i taught at a small liberal arts college so that allowed me to sort of express some widely interdisciplinary you know interests that i had in mythology in the relationship between religion and science in the relationship between brain science and the sort of emotions that we learn about in psychology so I taught a number of different psych courses, but I also taught a course on um, psyche and film that looked at the history of psyche, among other things, a course on psychology through Shakespeare. I taught a course on narrative and identity. Um, I taught a course I taught for 10 years on brain, mind, and spirit, which is about you know, uh, people's sense of their, their spirituality and how it ties to their their psychology and their daily conscious experience and, and how they make sense out of that. So there's a bunch of different things I got to do. Uh, most recently, you know, just before I retired, I started a course on emotion that a lot of undergraduate programs across the country don't have. And I think it's sad. I think it's weird, actually. People don't go into psychotherapy because they have bad thoughts. They go into psychotherapy because they feel really bad. Mm -hmm. And so it's both knowledge of and it, how our bodies are involved in that emotional life that becomes so important. And, you know, helping students understand that and to think through these things from, for themselves and to learn how to think a little bit more critically involves asking themselves questions. It involves a certain amount of strategic doubt, not only of other people's arguments, you criticize their logic, their evidence, but also of your own. And that's the hardest thing to do. And that's why trust is so important to teaching. Because if you think about it, the times that you're able to hear something that's not so positive about you is only from someone you trust. Somebody you don't like tells you something bad, you go, you know, hell with you. But if it's a friend, if it's a lover, if it's someone that's close to you, you kind of listen. Someone, an enemy says, you were such a jerk at that party Friday night, and you go, you know, so were you. If a friend tells you that, you say, oh God, what did I do? Because we see parts of ourselves we wouldn't otherwise see through the kinds of stories other people say make up about us. Yeah. And some of it is made up, of course. But Well, but that's part of how we get to know who we really are, what we take from well, other you know, people and what we don't. What it, here's one of the things that really disturbs me. <laughs> and it's a funny one because it starts with talking about stories that you know your parents told about. One of my earliest memories... And I share this with my class all the time. My kids used to love when I did this because they just laugh is a story that my mother used to tell frequently um, about me holding her hand on Nicolette Avenue in Minneapolis, where I lived until I was about two and a half. Um, so I mean, I was really young. And she tells the story of me standing there and saying, big car, make Johnny go boom. Isn't that cute? Well, it's cute for a number of reasons. One, it's probably more complicated of a sentence than I actually said at age two, where I probably said something like, car big Johnny. I never referred to myself as Johnny, so it's weird that way. <laughs> but the other thing is, when I remember this, that my mother probably told bragging to relatives and friends about how linguistic I was, that when I remember that, my visual image of that is standing about 10 feet behind, seeing this little boy looking up toward his mother. Well, if it's a memory of me standing 10 feet behind, what well, was I having an out-of-body experience or what? Now, in fact, a lot of your memories are that way. If you think about them, think about what the camera angle is, mm -hmm. about where your perspective is on the story. You see yourself in the scene. Well, that's not just a record then, is it? If you see yourself in the scene, it means you're reconstructing it. It means you're putting it together. The interesting thing about that big car make Johnny go boom memory is as the years have gone on, the little boy in that picture looks more and more like John John Kennedy looked at his father's cortege after he's assassinated. That little kind of cap he had, that little jacket. When I was recently giving a talk about this, I actually looked up some of those old pictures and found out it wasn't a black coat and hat. It was only black because I remember it from black and white TV. Um, it was actually a bright blue coat, but that's not part of my memory. 
But it's it's you add these things to your memories, you know, later on as they go on. You know, I never thought about it that way. And I know that what happened isn't real to some degree. And what may happen hasn't happened yet, so it can't be real. So the only thing we really have is in this moment, but in every moment, right, it changes in a second. Yeah. So you also have all of the layerings of all the stories that you've accumulated over years and years and years that have formed both how who you are, how you are, what kind of stories, where do your stories come from? They can come from, you know, Bible stories. They can come from mythology. I mean, you ask a class full of students who their favorite Disney princess is. And everyone, even the guys, have their favorite Disney princess. And you can learn a lot about them by asking them, well, why that one? You get the nerdy reader types, and it's always beauty, because beauty was the reader. My daughter, first time I took her, I took her to Disneyland, not Disney World, and she was a little bit older by the time I took her. And she really wanted to get the autographs of all the Disney princesses, and she especially wanted to meet Beauty. So she goes up, Beauty has her own store, and you get to meet her and talk to her and get her autograph. And my daughter goes up to Beauty and, and wants to know what she's been reading. Because Beauty of Beauty and the Beast was the breeder. She was had a book all the time. And the poor idiot sorority girl with a caked on makeup just gave her this completely blank look because she'd read nothing. And her most recent meet reading was a magazine. My daughter was so disappointed because her identification with Beauty was because mm-hmm. Beauty was a reader. And so was she. Wow. So interesting, interesting. story. Very you know. interesting. And very interesting. Oh, and so I just want to remind everybody once again. Please feel free to call us. Computers, that's plural, to the name. Sorry. Computers 2K Voice on Skype. And if you are watching us on Facebook, you can come over to nissancommunications.com and partake in the show from there if you'd like to ask us questions in our chat. And if you're watching us on YouTube, kind of like the same way, because we have a chat here and we'd love to have you. So please join us you know, live on Nissan. Okay. So, so what started you off and what is at the core of your work and started you off in the stories and why does that matter? Okay. I think a big part of it, what's the central to it is teaching about theories of personality where you have, you know, something about genetics, you know, something about, you know, the inheritability of traits, but you also learn that the overlay on all of it and how we make sense of our lives is the kind of life story that we tell. And it's, it's that that we start to do, it's part of the identity crisis in young adulthood, where you start to put, put together a story of all the different pieces of your life and how they fit together. Um, it got more interesting, and this was not long after I'd become a professor, that an old friend of mine, we were having a long conversation one time, you know, over beers at some pub, And he was asking me, you know, if I hadn't become a professor, if I hadn't gotten my doctorate, what would I have done? I said, you know, I didn't know. I didn't think the doctor was that important. I figured I'd live some kind of intellectual life. And he looked at me and he said, John, you are so full of it. Hmm. Like a friend will sometimes do. Now, he was a real fan of Moby Dick. And he gave me this amazing quote that I never get quite right, but it's about Ahab sitting on the prow of the boat, looking out over the the gunnels saying, move me not from the iron rail. And he said that that was you as, as a graduate student. And it was like, whoa, I was like the devil looking for the whale. And he said, you know, you were, you were really, really obsessed. And it's only when I heard him tell my life as Ahab that I got a very different perspective on myself. And that story is, is one that became the center of accounting for some things that went on in my life. Like I got denied tenure at Penn state. It's a whole long story, which you probably don't want to hear about. Um, but I was blindsided because I went through a number of different layers of the process and was told sent to the next level was finally at the last one that I got nailed. Well, I tell the story of being Ahab and of harpooning the whale. That big white whale was for me, Penn State. Well, what happens to Ahab when he does harpoon the whale? He's 
crucified on the side of it practically, and then the whale dives and he's lost then. I get cut loose by them not giving me tenure, which is ultimately probably a good thing. And I bob to the surface and I see this, you know, it's shark infested waters. So there's this little boat and I heave myself over the, the prow of this boat and toss myself in the bottom of it, you know, catching my breath, feeling this incredible sense of relief that I've avoided the, the shark infested waters. And the name on the back of the boat was Elizabethtown. The little college, liberal arts college that I got a job at after that. <laughs> and I heave myself in this little boat that just says E-Town on the back that has no water and no sail. And I see the storm clouds of middle age forming on the horizon. <laughs> and it just, you know, continues from there. But it's like you, you take these stories. They can be Bible stories. They can be myths. They can be movies you saw and you make sense out of your life and you do that sometimes that's how you watch movies you identify with the character you put yourself in their place you feel some of the things that they felt and the stories that are like those and they're modified for your own experience to be sure become very much a part of who you and how and how the emotions you feel when you think about yourself so um, a you lot of stories are just about shaping our emotions so what do you suggest would. people do do you suggest people, so I heard, so journaling, so that you're writing and you're hearing yourself write and you're experiencing yeah. and you remember the emotion and then you take it deeper, talking to friends, you know, sharing an experience, being open. So, okay, so, so back up a second. The emotion. Best. The emotion. best of all yeah. stuff, of all of it, is a face-to-face -face communication, a face-to-face -face conversation with people mm -hmm. that is about how you remember your life, what you think about. And they're wonderful conversations because they can really only happen between people that know each other well. No one else cares, really, but it's, how do you, how do you get to know somebody? You're sharing stories. And you got to listen. And you which have to listen my, to theirs. My thing. Listen. Yeah. yeah. And, and you learn about where somebody else has been. So, so it's been Ishmael instead so you, of a right. And you, so you mentioned emotion and the, the, the importance of emotion, because so when you hear as let's say you and I are friends, right? I hear emotion in your voice about something or in something you're doing. I get to ask you a question. Sure. I get to ask you a question about that emotion that your experience. How'd that make you feel? How'd that make Why'd you, you feel? feel that way? Right. When else have you felt that way? What are you going to do about it? Right. And then the story can come from there. Yeah. Right. Or well, you, in, yeah, go ahead. in some ways, I think, I think this is, you look at the, the evolutionary history of human language use and human storytelling. And there's a sense in which our, our brains kind of explode. I mean, they get the frontal cortex gets really huge. There's something called a homeobox gene that just controls the growth of the neural tube and you leave the end of it turned on longer. So you get this huge frontal cortex that the rest of our mammalian, you know, emotional system really can't handle. How we handle it is by shaping things into stories. A story has a, a, a difficulty, a problem that you have some emotional response to. There's a, a tension that, that builds to a, a crescendo, to a peak of passion and arousal, and then there's some resolution. And we may need to put things into that form in order to remember them. So okay. back to Eric Erickson again, who I think I talked to you about before, Yeah, you know, the, the identity crisis of, of young adulthood, there's a, a lot of people that have done research on it. And it's, they describe it as this crisis because they did research on college students originally. And, you know, people describe themselves as going through a, a choice, a crisis and a commitment. But then you interview those same people 10 years later and they say, what crisis? Why? Because in order to remember something, they had to put it in this kind of crisis language because that's how you put something into a story form. That's how you remember it. But they look back now and they say, oh, no, that was inevitable. I would have had to end up this way, you know, or something close to it. But let me tell you about, you know, what I'm going through now. So, John, let me interrupt you a minute because I got to say several. So, first of all, do we... Do most of us, would you say, uh, process in the form of pictures? I, I think almost everything we do is visual. And I don't think that every culture is necessarily as visual as we are. 
from the kind of Greco-Roman tradition. I think the Semitic tradition was far more about, about sounds. Um, but you you know that when you put things into words, you hear the sounds in your head. And, and you I see think, the picture. Of, I mean, of it's course. a story. The story is a, seems like a well, picture to me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all in, in story form. There's a wonderful new book out by Antonio Damasio, who's one of my favorite, you know, researchers in, in the brain and neuroscience. And it's called The Strange Order of Things. Mm -hmm. And he basically says that that's, you know, are, are being able to form images and invent them in some cases is just, that's the stream of thought. It's all in this imagery form. But there's a second layer, and that's the layer of language and storytelling that allows you to move in and out of that stream of images move along different pathways, bring other images to mind that, that words allow you, and stories in particular, allow you to do. Because it's probably the story form that allows us to remember and to have voluntary control over which of those we bring to mind. And we all have our favorite stories. Right. You know, if you have, if you have aging parents, you, you, you learn that they tell the same stories over and over again. We probably all do to that to some extent, because when we get to know someone, we're they're getting to know our most important stories, our, our basic repertoire of stories. Now, yeah, I mean, I would say for 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 myself, in, in fact, and been doing the show for so long, there are certain stories, experiences that I will share probably over and over and over again. And then as a new experience comes into my life. It might take a little bit of time, and maybe this is for a lot of people, I don't know, but it takes a little time, I think, to put it into a, a new story. You know, maybe you have a bit of the story, yep. and then it expands yep. as we grow, as we learn, and as we, have, as we discover the emotion that's attached. And it, it go, and it can, it's a constant, it's, that chapter will keep on going indefinitely. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, you know, it yeah. turns out that some of the healing for mm -hmm. people with like PTSD comes from storytelling. I mean, they have a bunch of images that don't make sense, that they really can't put together in meaningful form. People remember that, can really remember some horrible, nasty things happening in their lives, and it's still, they remember it as being in the past. But until you put it into story form, that stuff can come up like it's happening right now, like it's happening over and over and over again, and you're back in, in Iraq, or you're back in Vietnam, or what have you. And uh, there's a guy that wrote a book about this called uh, Achilles in Vietnam that talks about the importance of making those things meaningful that otherwise weren't by putting them into story form. But we're all doing that all the time. You know, some things happen and it's only the ones worth telling. Right. I mean, you go on vacation and it was a wonderful vacation. You sat on a beach and drank mint juleps every day. Mm -hmm. Boring. You have nothing to share with your friends when you get home. If there was, you know, your, your, well, we were coming back from Las Vegas, my wife and I, and the plane got diverted to Denver because if someone got sick on the plane, they need to have emergency landing. That's a story where just, you know, some of the other stuff is just boring. And, right. and it's having it and being able to tell it as a story. Sometimes we, we put ourselves in, in not such good situations because it makes a better story. And, and, I think, and I think we have to remember, too, some, a lot of times that we talk ourselves in and out of things is talking yeah. ourselves in and out of one story to another. And so, well, uh, go ahead. when you think about that notion of having this basic repertoire of stories, here's the really scary thing. You think about a story that the more you tell it, the better it gets, right? You modify the story a little bit. You look a little bit better even every time you tell it. There's there's some interesting details, and the ones that have a better effect on your audience you keep, and the ones that don't you drop. Being a college lecturer, you change your lectures every week because of that. And you keep the good stuff, and you drop the stuff that doesn't work. Same thing with stories about ourselves. Now, here's the problem. The more often you tell a story, the more confident you are that that's what really happened. But the more unreliable the story actually becomes, because you import more and more things from other situations, from movies, from other experiences that maybe weren't part of what actually happened. I told a story for years and it's not, it doesn't paint me very well. It's a story of being five or six and breaking one of my little brother's collarbones. And in the story that I've told for probably 20 years, I am so angry like you can sometimes get at a, at a sibling that I wanted to hit him. 
I didn't want to punch him in the face because that might really hurt him and make him bloody. And then I thought I want to hit him in the chest, but I've hit him in the chest that might like hurt his heart somehow, I, you know? So I just hit him on the shoulder as hard as I could and felt the bone snap. And part of the, of the, what makes that such a good story, the sound of that bone snapping. Oh my God. Well, I've talked to my brother about this and he has no recollection of this happening. And I'm not sure the more I think about it, whether I really am the one that broke it or whether I was supposed to be watching him and he fell down. So I started feeling responsible for it in a way that becomes more and more part of the story that turns out 20 years later to not be true. What happens I think then? We all have a lot of stories like that because the more you tell it, the more confidence you are. And, but the more you tell it, the less reliable it probably is. So be careful of the stories that you like telling. They but, may be the least true. Right. But, but, and I, and I also uh, I think I'm hearing from you is tell your stories anyway and learn, oh God, have, right. And learn from to. the experience of the story changing. Well, it's also you, even the fictional parts of it. I mean, I, I learned something partly I'm sure from what happened at the time about my responsibility for, for my siblings. But part of it was in the telling of the story of my actually that I'm responsible, that I can hurt someone like that, that I can hurt someone like that, even when I'm trying a number of strategies to avoid hurting him too much that. And even though that's actually turns out to not be true, I believed it to be true for many, many years, but it also may have helped me not hurt my brothers as much as I might otherwise had if I hadn't had that story to tell. It's, it's, I, I know stories are fascinating. I love people's stories and I love hearing my own stuff and hearing my own stories and, and listening to, you you know, talking about this and I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, well, you know, when you hear that discrepancy, it's really important to listen into the discrepancy to find out where it came from. Yeah. Why is there a discrepancy? Go ahead. I talked to, I gave a talk at, at a, a, a conference of, of nonfiction writers, which includes a lot of people that write memoir. And one of the commitments of people that write memoir is to try to be honest, as honest as you can, because otherwise it's non, otherwise it's fiction. And you're trying to, at the contract with your reader is you are trying to, and, and sometimes memoir writers go deep and they, it, it's a, a psychological battle for them especially when their stories are about hardship or addiction or, or a life of crime or, or their divorce or what have you. Um, and they're really committed to that sense of, of honesty. And then you go, but wait a second, what do you do when you, you find out that a story that you've been telling for years isn't true? How much, what do you think about the other stories you tell? Are you only being feeling like you're being honest because you've, done a much better job of fooling yourself first. I think it makes for pretty dangerous ground to believe. And, and there's, you know, part of the, the revolution of the early part of the 20th century of doubting our introspections of that, that kind of interpretive principle of doubt. It's like, be careful. Don't be so sure of yourself because even the things that you carry with you as, as part of this central repertoire that other people that get to know you get to know you by hearing these stories. Um, they're stories, people, right? and they may have value qua story, not because they necessarily f refer to some literal sense set of events that occurred, but those stories are important because of their, they're important because of how they code your emotions, how they code your understanding of your own feelings and how they've changed. And I think, I mean, I think that's what psychotherapy is all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, a psychotherapist doesn't check your history uh, check old school records, look at old x-rays. The psychotherapist, their job is to help you take stories that you tell about yourself that make it harder for you to live and revise them without mucking with the facts too much, but revise them into stories that enable them to live their lives better. I mean, I can tell the story about coming, you know, getting denied tenure at Penn State and coming to this little liberal arts college that it was, you know, it, um, it was a cultural desert. It was, you know, entering hell that I'd lost my life and as a professor at an R1 institution. 
Or I can tell it as, oh my God, I was so lucky. Thank God I got cut loose from that whale and ended up where I did because I got to do all this interdisciplinary teaching. And I got to teach, you know, students across the whole four years of their career and then follow them afterwards. And it just, I can tell the story in both ways. And it has the same facts in it, but it's a very different story. And also who's listening. Oh, sure. <laughs> right? So you can of be course. telling a story one way and then based on, and then you cannot control how somebody else is, you know, listening to it, taking it in. Because for me, listening is at the core of everything. Because we listen to understand emotion. We listen to understand how to use the emotion. We listen to the stories. We listen to figure out what story to tell. We listen to what words. I mean, everything to me is the, is is listening is the connector for everything. Well, and part of self-knowledge, I think, is listen to what you're saying. Someone says to you, what are you saying? Listen to what you're saying. And you stop and you say, oh, geez, that really kind of is a little twisted or that wasn't what you just said to me or why am I doing that? And what need in, in me is that serving and maybe not serving well? You know? So where are you suggesting people somewhat end up? Where are we in order to be at like a base for, you know, for ourselves being able to listen to the story, tell the story, hear your story, share, know about the story, all these things. Where are we working to get to? you, You have to be in your body. You have to be in your body. And there's so much about our culture text-based communication, electronic communication, you know, that most of our interactions are, you know, sitting over a keyboard typing that you can control all the information that you're, you're, you're telling other people that you, they can get your modified story, your, your edited story. But the problem is that when you're telling it to them face to face, it's real different and they can see all sorts of things you would, you may not be intending to convey, but they get to know you better. And because of their mirror to you, you get to know yourself better in that process too. I would say to a lot of people, remember conversation. Remember conversation. Recover conversation. Mm -hmm. Conversations are great. In my introductory psychology class for about the last five years I taught it, the last 10 minutes of class, I swear to God, I did this. I would stop the class. Each person in the class was assigned to an interlocutor, something they have to talk to. And they would have to spend the next 10 minutes just having a conversation with this other person. And I think for some of them, it was really a threat initially until they actually start getting to know this person a little bit. And they're not their friends. I mean, I randomly assign them. So they're stuck with somebody that they maybe don't like, but they're getting to know them. And as they get to know them, they kind of get to like them better too and each other. John, that's the purpose behind all of my books. Yeah. Listening into the heart of, you know, in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of men, now twins, next millennials, so that when you listen into the heart of the story, the heart of the person, the heart of the philosophy, you get to understand. Yeah. You know, you get to, uh, you know, agree to disagree. You know what I mean? You get to understand. I think is having a conversation that goes more than three seconds, Mm -hmm. that is more than Twitter. That is more than, I mean, I write, when I write emails, it's like the old model of correspondence where you can write a few pages and it's just, it's not the model most people use, but it's a model of having the same voice that you would use in a conversation where you actually have to. So we need to connect. We need to connect. But also listening to what they say back. Right. So we need to connect, right, John? We need to connect. If someone says you're full of it and you trust them and you realize that you are, you know, then you have to ask. Like, how do you think, how, in what way do you think I'm full of it? Yeah. Basically. Because that helped me realize where I really am and where I'm really coming from in this. And it just, and it's mutual. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it's someone you've gotten to know, there's a trust that's involved in it, that you're willing to take the risk of telling them something that maybe you're a little bit less sure about mm-hmm. or something that, I mean, your repertoire of good stories that you tell someone you're, when you're just getting to know them, those are the ones that, have, that you've, you've told over and over and you're good at telling them and you know how to tell that story. It's not the same as the ones that when you're trying to figure something out or you just got dumped or you just had a, a, a defeat 
or you just had some crisis occur and you're trying to make sense out of it. And those are probably the ones that are the most important, really. And I, we all know that. Um, Cause they're raw, means, they're raw and real. Yeah. You know, and it means I, put your phone down. Right. You know? So, so I do, um, haven't done one in a little while, but I do, you know what a talking stick is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've done many, uh, sessions with groups of people who have never been together before. And if, for those of you that don't know what a talking stick is, it's a native American culture. It's a stick from a tree usually. And in the old, old tribal days, you know, maybe the chief put things on the stick that had meaning to, had meaning to his tribe and they would use it. Oh yeah. Amnon's got one. Oh man. Thank you. Look, <laughs> whoa, here's one. This is great. So, uh, so Amnon was part of one. Oh, oh, I a love this. Yeah. So instead of me putting things on people who came to the circle, put things on the stick with some meaning attached. And yeah. what we would do is we would go around in the circle and people would express what they put on the stick. And then it just went from there. And the interesting thing about, thank you so much. The interest, thank you, Amnon. The interesting thing about people expressing what they put on, because everything was different and, and the things they put on came from a different place, a, a, a story, a meaning of some sort, is that we each got to hear yeah. the heart and soul of someone. Cut right through the chase. Got to hear you know, someone. What's really funny about that is the differences between the people that have a hard time giving the stick up and the people that have the stick and are just, it makes them really scared. I went with a colleague of mine that took a, you know, a bunch of students on a winter trip to uh, Prague and Vienna. And at the end of the trip, the students had one assignment is they had to stand up in front of the group and talk for three minutes, three minutes. That's nothing. And these poor kids, most of them were completely freaked out about this because they had to tell a story, a three minute long story of their experience that they had over this couple of weeks and visiting foreign cultures. And you learn more about these kids from these three minute stories at the end of the trip than you really did from a lot of just watching them on the trip because you're seeing how they're trying to put it together. Exactly. And some of them are amazing. Exactly, just- exactly. And in this circle and in every circle I've been a part of, when people don't know each other, it doesn't matter whether they do, it doesn't matter. They hear a piece of somebody they never heard before. And what that does immediately is it connects people immediately without, without hesitation. And then people can share whatever they want. It just cuts through it. And it's, it's a beautiful, it honestly, a, it's a beautiful thing. So anytime you have an opportunity to connect is, is the way it's supposed to be. And you know, it makes it even more interesting. And, and, you know, I, I fear that, A lot of people that rely too much on electronic communication don't do this anywhere near enough. And that is a talking stick is something that you see in public. It's something you're really willing to, you know, to share in front of a group, to add, you know, as as a souvenir piece, as a memento to the talking stick. But it's a very public thing And, and public speaking can be can be scary. And that's that's fine. But it's about how much do you get to know someone by coming into their intimate space, not just not hearing their secrets, but seeing the stuff they keep around them. I mean, I look at the books behind you and the desk behind you and the trees behind you through, through the big window. And I get a, a different sense of who you, you are than, than I would if and that that's stuff wasn't that's not real. <laughs> none of that, none, none of the thing, none of that is, is a picture. How, however, <laughs> however, that's good. I love it. But it's that's nice not, picture. but that's not, but you do tell, you can tell something about me, right? You can tell yeah. that we picked that picture, right? Right. To go behind me. So there's a deeper story. Don't give up. Here's the thing. Use your listening not to give up a piece of something. It, 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 don't stop it being wrong. Don't stop it being right. Don't stop at any of those things when you have an opportunity to engage and understand somebody, don't stop anywhere. Allow your listening to be perked, you know, allow your ears to kind of go, Whoa, what? And, and, and let yourself go deeper with things. Cause you, you know, he could have just stopped and was okay, move on to the next subject. But this tells you something about me. 
Yeah. And that's what you want to know, right? I thought it was a little bit weird that the desk right behind you is empty. I'm going, is she in a room with two desks? But nope. you're not. It's just a picture. Well, I am in the room with, well, sort of kind of two desks, but they don't look like that. <laughs> so that, that, that's good because you don't, yeah. don't, don't leave and, he, and, and don't leave. And I notice a lot of times in the connection that people have when they're communicating with each other is they communicate with their own assumptions and be, be ginger with that. I mean, if you hear yourself having assumptions about somebody, put it out on the table, ask yeah. in a lovely way, you know, yeah. find out what's going on. Is this what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, this, these are, you know, these are things we all do. And, and, and I guarantee you, th there's nothing that anybody really does that somebody else doesn't do. No, we're all the same in that way. And, you know, no matter how weird or how twisted you think your story is, there's there's that old thing that the therapists say all the time. You know, if if you think somebody's not crazy, you don't know them well enough yet. Because, in fact, they're just as crazy as you are, probably. Yeah, you just in don't know. Ways. when. Yeah, you just don't <laughs> know when they were crazy. Yeah, maybe yeah. not in this moment. Maybe they were crazy last week. You should well, have seen me is... last week at the grocery store, right? <laughs> yeah. What's your hopes, John, by the work you do? Well, I, I think in some ways the hope is that I will continue to do the same sort of thing that I did as a professor, but that theoretically, you know, reaching, reaching a wider audience that doesn't have to, you know, pay $40,000 a year to do it. You know, it's, it's about giving it away. It really is. And what is and it I you're giving? It's, it's, it's giving the, my own experience, my reading, my knowledge, but it's also having used that reading and that knowledge of psychology and emotion and the brain to understand my own life better in a way that other people can also do that. Um, understanding, you know, which emotions are more subtle, which ones are, are, are less escapable. Um, I mean, one of the most simplest things about anger, for example, is there's a lot of people in a lot of cultures that they get angry, they act on it immediately. Well, emotions aren't right or wrong. They just are. What you do about them is what's right or wrong. But you have to learn to recognize them first. You say, okay, I'm really pissed. Now, what am I going to do about it? It can energize action. It can make you do hurtful things. But it also tells you that you've had some sense of violation. And you have to then ask yourself, and therapists will often ask this, you know, anger often hides a fear. What's the fear behind the anger? You're angry about something because you're afraid that something's going to be taken away from you, that someone's going to find out something about you that you don't want them to know, that some sense, some story, some image that you have of yourself is being threatened. And those ego threats are the ones that get you the angriest of all. But there's all these different emotions that have different functions. I mean, one of the most scary emotions to me is the emotion of disgust. Because disgust is one of the hardest emotions to counter condition. When you experience disgust with somebody or something, you just, you reject it. You just want it away from you. You don't want to think about it anymore. You don't want to look at it. You don't examine it. You just want it apart from you. And unfortunately, we're living in a culture that more and more often people use that disgust as a way of distancing themselves of not engaging of being less tolerant of other people and there's some really simple things about disgust i mean there's wonderful studies that are done that have people if you do a disgust ma manipulation you show someone one of those plastic you know um dog feces things and that's disgusting and people or you do a, a cleanliness manipulation you have people wash off their hands with just one of those wet wipe towels people are nicer and make um more compassionate judgments when they've done a cleansing manipulation and they judge people more harshly when they've had this disgust emotion tied to it. Our sense of how people smell of the, the things people do. I think a lot of the response to homosexuality, which thankfully is largely lifted, is people's disgust at the thought of what these people do. Well, so are you, are you looking like to... And, and let's get into a little bit of um, marketing. 
Are you looking to sell a book? Are you looking to coach people? Are you looking for people to come to hear you? What is it that you're, how are you looking to, uh, to do this? And what is it? Okay. I've only been retired for a year, so I'm working on it. Okay. Um, the start was to work on how I develop the content in writing the blogs. The next step is to do a much fuller job of doing, you know, the, the recorded versions of those. Um, I mean, I, I obviously, you know, I like speaking in front of an audience. That's one of the things I liked about teaching and I like about, you know, speaking engagements, but there's also a sense that, that the way you reach more people, I think is often, um, it's not just the video appearances get, get old, the, the, the technology for doing the recording fades. I mean, look at an old VHS tape and they just, they look like my face probably looks now because I couldn't get the camera working right. Um, but those fade and the written stuff is the stuff that gets sustained. Now the conflict I have, of course, is that being able to read what somebody writes means you have to be able to hear their voice too. So I think maybe what, what my goal is, is to figure out some different ways to do this. I got an I idea did. for you, John. Okay, shoot. Are you ready? Yeah. I think you should do a show. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I think you and Amnon should have a casual conversation because the, the, a lot of people share about stories. Yeah. Oh, uh, a lot of people, I mean, you know what? I started loving stories probably, I, Amnon and I go back a long ways, but I would say 15 years ago, maybe yeah. 16, 15, 14 years ago. And then because of understanding, and it was because I started having a listening practice, I started being aware of stories. And then I did a, a newsletter <clears throat> with people's yeah. stories in it. And I realized people were really interested in men's stories over women's stories. Because the ones that got open the most were the men, not the women's, because we, don't, we didn't know that much about how men were feeling, thinking, whatever. Right. But people's stories at the at the at the water fountain. I mean, put all this together yeah. and stories are huge. I love them. And to to be able to talk about them in in a lot of the ways that you have and to welcome people to talk. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. You might consider. You know, I, I my wife and friends have told me, you know, I, I really need to to put this, you know, the recorded versions along with my blog so that people can just listen to them in their car. And the millennials I've talked to have said that a lot of them wouldn't take the time to read and wouldn't necessarily take the time to watch either. Right. But they're willing to listen. You, now a show, mm -hmm. a show is more fun. Because well, it's you, more you, fun. It's engaging in the moment. That's true. <clears throat> so people can be listening. They could be doing whatever. And, and, the other thing I've noticed with doing some work on my on other things, people may may watch a video that's taped and we get a lot of people to, you know, on YouTube and all, but yeah. they don't not necessarily listening and watching to the whole thing. Yeah. People are fast. And I'm just saying I have a feeling and just for and I know that you might do very well. I think you would do really, you know, having a show with people talking about stories and sharing well, stories in I, real life. That's, that really is worth thinking about because I think I also very much like, you know, talking to people, not only in, you know, standing up in front of an audience, like in a classroom or, or giving a, 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 doing a speaking engagement, but doing this kind of thing. And when you're, you're just, you're doing the talking head, this is like how conversation occurs. And that might actually be more fun. Well, I, I am I not perfect by no stretch. I am not I have I I don't go to the hairdresser before I come and I don't go to the makeup artist before I get here. I am me. I do the very very best that I yeah. can in crafting a show with the help of Chris and of course Amnon in putting people out here in our show that we get to share that have something to say that will break us free. Stories yeah. are huge, right? So, but I I do this as me. Yeah. And I and 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 that's the part of stories in the delivery that is so important is that we we are I am an example. Yeah. I'm the experiment and we get to learn from each other in our experiments. 
I think part of the thing that I've liked about writing the blogs is that unlike scholarly writing, where you got to document everything, um, A, I don't have to do that. I mean, I refer people to books all the time um, because I read, but it's also that I get to include more personal detail. Right. I get to include more of myself. Right. Absolutely. Than I than I can in scholarly or than I even can really in class because there's things I can write in a blog they wouldn't necessarily say in front of a classroom, um, and I think maybe doing that in a, a visual context like this, I don't know. I have to get used to my well, face. Think about it. Think I, about I've it. I got used to my voice, but eh, my yeah, face. No, but I don't. Th but think about it, and 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 this is really. I don't usually do this on the air like this, so to speak, but the intimacy that we get yeah. to share through our stories and our own life lessons. This is a life happening in the moment. This is not something that I, that happened yesterday. This is you, this is happening in the moment where we are having this dialogue that yeah. you have, you know, um, you audience friends out there, family that are listening, you have opportunities in moments to do things that yeah. are just like this, maybe not over the air, Maybe it's over coffee. Maybe it's over a muffin. Maybe it's dinner. Whatever it is, it's we have opportunities to be intimate, and 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 be able to share from our heart who we are, what we know, what we don't know, what we're tripping over. Here's a question for you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I mean, I, I actually did some research on nonverbal behavior, in which I show people videotapes of people having a conversation over a table and then just from their nonverbal behavior, how good of a judgment you can make of what kind of relationship they have, even if you turn the sound off. And it's, it's interesting. There's a bunch of findings I could talk a lot more about, but I won't. Here's the question. Um, do you think it works better to do it this way where I can see your face, you can see mine for an audience that then has to switch back and forth between our faces or would it be better to, I mean, it might be easier just to have people on site where you can be having a conversation that really is embodied in face to face in a way that it's not. Now, I'd have to come down to where you in Raleigh, you know, it, it'd be it'd be hard to do that. But my wife suggested this to me when I shortly after I I retired, and that is, why don't we just have some conversations like we'd have over a table with a you know a beer or a glass of wine, you know, just two people having a her perspectives, biology, mine's, mine's psychology and neuroscience and mythology. And, you know, that's a way of doing it. I'm going to answer you very simply. There's no right and wrong. And you're thinking about it too much. It, any of it will work. That's the point. Yeah. Anything will yeah. work. If you were sitting here with me now, wouldn't you love it out there? Absolutely. If you're sitting, it, it, it doesn't matter as, yeah. as long as we do it and, and whatever it's like, how many books can you read about Nora, whatever? Yeah. I, I mean, there are a million books out there. One yeah. book is going to make a difference to one person. The second book is going to make a difference to the other person. It does. It, that's all great. It's, it all matters. Yeah. And it, and, and we, we get too hung up sometimes on how it looks, what's going to be the best way, what's not the right way, whatever. That's, we don't need to do that. All we need to do is just do it. You know, do your best well, to say it. I'm in getting, the, Go I'm ahead. getting better. I'm yeah. trying different things. The next step is to do more audio. And, you know, I'm going to try doing some videos too. I, I've got a couple that I started with my wife that we just, we'd never had time to finish. We have a two-year-old, so we have some other things oh, on boy. our mind. Father. You do. But, <laughs> but, and, and, and unfortunately we're, we're, we're like out of time, but, yeah. but this has been great. And I would say you, you've done a fabulous job of what you've done in a year. So yeah. you can't have it looking any better than that. Yeah. Right? But let's you and I talk some more. Okay. Okay? I'd love to. I would I've love got to. Your, I've got your contact info, yeah. so I'm happy to do that. Yeah, and I'd love to. Absolutely. Anytime you want to have me. I would love to, and, I'd lo and I'm going to invite you to do one of my with my twin thing, and but you okay. can't know that about that. Really okay, cool. I'm not. You want to show my book? Stuff. Yeah, real quick. Here you go, my book, my two books on Amazon in just one afternoon, right. listening to the hearts of men, interviewed a bunch of men about their life, emotional journey. And now yeah. it's in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of twins, which is extraordinary. And next will be millennials. Be on the lookout for that. But John, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Glad Thank to you. be here. Glad to talk to you. And good luck with the books. And Thank you. The millennial one and the twin one, you know, I'm happy yeah. to help out. All with right, those you will. Like you will. I'm going to be in touch.
Okay, great. And everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us today and being part of this new story. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.